Greetings and welcome to the CCOS Building Successful Organic Business Webinar for Growers. We are very excited to have you here today. We have three great presenters who will share their experiences running or supporting farm businesses. In addition, we will review business development resources available to farmers. Before we begin, I wanted to give a warm thank you to our sponsor, Valent USA LLC. Valent USA LLC is committed to helping growers produce high quality organic crops. Valent offers a wide range of organic solutions to improve and protect crops, including insecticides such as Pyganic crop protection and Dipel biological insecticide. All products in the Valent organic portfolio are NOP compliant and OMRI listed. Visit valent.com forward slash organic for more information. If you're having difficulties connecting to the webinar, if you can't hear or you can't see, please call our office for support at 831-423-2263 and press zero for the operator and someone will help you connect to the webinar. My name is Megan Donovan and I will be your host today. I am a program specialist at the CCOF Foundation. CCOF advances organic agriculture for a healthy world. We advocate on behalf of our members for organic policies, support the growth of organic through education and grants, and provide organic certification that is personal and accessible. We're very excited to have three presenters with us today with decades of experience running organic farm businesses. Um, we have Thomas Nelson from Kitchen Table Advisor, Jim Durst from Durst Organic Growers, Inc., and Vernon Peterson from the Peterson Family Farm and Abundant Harvest Organics. I'll introduce each speaker in a little more depth prior to their presentation. But before we get started with our first speaker, I wanted to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's web event. We're looking at an example of the GoToWebinar attendee interface, which is made up of two parts. The viewer window on the left, which allows you to see everything the presenter will share on the screen, and the control panel on the right. Within the control panel is how you can participate in today's event, so let's take a look at that. By clicking the orange arrow, you can open and close your control panel. From the view menu, you can also set the control panel not to auto hide when inactive if you prefer to always keep it open. The audio pane provides audio information. By default, you have joined the webinar by mic and speakers. If you prefer, you can join the audio via telephone by selecting phone call and the dial-in information will be displayed. During the presentation, you have the ability to send questions to our webinar staff through the questions pane. Simply type in your question and click send. After each speaker, we will have time for a question and answer session. We will answer as many questions as we have time for. And as a final reminder, today's webinar is being recorded. Everyone will receive an email with a link to view the recording of today's event um, at any time and we will also send out a PDF of the PowerPoint slides. So we want to ask you to test out the questions pane. Um, we'd love to hear where you're calling in from today and what you produce on your farm. And just to let you know, we have a lot of people in the audience today, so we will try to respond to as many questions and comments as possible. We apologize in advance if we aren't able to get to your specific question and encourage you to follow up with us after the webinar if you have additional questions. We'll provide contact information at the end of the webinar. Thank you again for being here today and enjoy the presentation. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Thomas Nielsen. 
Thomas has devoted his life to building sustainable food systems that connect rural and urban areas. He is passionate about the ongoing economic and environmental viability of rural farming communities and has lived at Full Belly Farm in the Cape Valley of California since 1995. Thomas is the president and co-founder of Cape Valley Farm Shop, a community-owned social enterprise that aggregates and distributes local seasonal food from almost 50 small and mid-sized family farms in Yolo County. Thomas earned his Master's of Business Administration at the University of California, Davis, with a focus on social entrepreneurship. He serves on the boards of California FarmLink and the Fruit Guys Community Fund. Through Kitchen Table Advisors, Thomas is thrilled to invest his time helping small, sustainable farms build their businesses. So Thomas, thank you for being here today, and I will hand the presentation over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with all of you today. Um, I'm going to talk about our work at Kitchen Table Advisors and share some lessons learned as a farm business advisor. Uh, our mission is to fuel the economic viability of sustainable farmers and ranchers through practical business advising and trusted relationships. Um, and I also you know, bring my experience running a, a rural food hub, Cape Valley Farm Shop, uh, which is in, based in Esparto and Yolo County, and also my experience living at Full Belly Farm um, just up Highway 16. Um, I'd like to cover a few areas in my presentation. Uh, one, how Kitchen Table Advisors supports farmers and ranchers. Uh, two is common obstacles to farm business success. Three is strategies for overcoming them. And I'll also touch on, on resources that are available. So Kitchen Table Advisors formed five years ago to invest in the next generation of small farmers and ranchers with the idea that their success will contribute to positive social and environmental outcomes. Our founder, Anthony Chang, started with a hypothesis that one-on-one -on -one business advising could increase economic viability of organic and pastured livestock operations. Um, beginning with a pilot cohort of 10 farms in 2013, over a three-year period, we supported our clients to increase net income, uh, increasing it by an average of 67%. Based on the pilot's results, we began scaling and refining the program to be able to serve 50 farms each year. Currently, we work with 29 farmers and ranchers in the Central Coast, as well as Alameda, Marin, Sonoma, and Yolo counties. We select farms who are at an inflection point in their business. So typically clients have three to 10 years of production experience and want to go from scraping by to making a living. We meet farmers where they're at with their business, uh, focusing on making budgets, planning cash flows, improving record keeping, growing sales, charting a vision, and setting goals. Uh, we support our clients by providing free hands-on business advising, meeting with farmers and ranchers eight to 10 times per year over a three-year period. We connect clients with pro bono professionals, so in the areas of human resources, legal, marketing. Uh, these are folks that we call volunteer farm advisors. And we, we remain available to our alumni as advisors and connectors in a peer-based knowledge sharing network. Uh, we're currently a team of six staff, including one and three quarter full-time farm business advisors. And we're, we're actually hiring more part-time business advisors be able to serve the 50 farms a year. Half of our funding comes from individuals, along with support from private foundations and businesses. So I, I mentioned earlier that we meet our clients at whatever point they're at in their business. For example, with their markets and sales channels, their record keeping systems, uh, their ways of managing labor. Um, the product mix and, and business strategy of each client varies tremendously but some common themes emerge amongst the farms we work with. Number one is that the business of farming is hard, um, making it tough to succeed. You know, a few common obstacles that I frequently see are access to capital, access to land, and record keeping. 
Uh, new farmers often find it difficult to access capital, relying on small savings accounts and expensive credit card debt to get going and grow. It's, it's tough to build assets and capitalize a business based just on net income. As such, borrowing money at a reasonable cost to cover early season operations or to buy equipment is a major issue. Farmers and bankers usually don't speak the same language. As a farm business advisor, I, I serve as a translator helping farmers to communicate their plans in terms of cash flow projections and enterprise budgets, and helping them understand the various components of credit that bankers use to evaluate loan applications. Long-term land tenure is also a major issue. Short-term leases inhibit investment in infrastructure that supports more efficient operations. Over time, farmers in it for the long haul are in search of secure, long-term leases and, and property ownership. We support our farmers to assess what they can afford, structure financing, and develop good leases. Without good financial records, it's very difficult to make the best decisions. Key is to understand the profitability of your crops and enterprises within your business. Good financial records allow you to track income, variable expenses, and over overhead. So by looking at your gross margin, that is, your income minus your variable expenses, and knowing what your overhead is, you can calculate the sales that you need to meet your net income goal. I work closely with farmers to understand the key drivers in their business model to adjust prices, budget sales, and manage expenses. It's up to each farmer to define his or her economic goals. Key factors for success include being persistent, cultivating a growth mindset, and aligning activity with profits. Building a successful business takes time. Understanding markets, your customers, building your systems and team, these all take years of experience. So the decisions you make today will play out over a season or longer, but over time they add up to charting a successful course. Your most important asset is your time and your skills, which will only grow with experience. We live in a globally connected, technologically innovating, fast-changing world. Success requires a willingness to keep learning and adapting. You'll face known challenges like equipment breakdowns and unknown challenges like shifting markets. What's important is maintaining a positive attitude and learning from your mistakes. And I know m many farmers who have had to change their sales and product mix often, evaluating on an annual basis. Keep abreast of change. Be willing to continually evaluate what's working and what can be improved. Is there a new piece of equipment to help you control weeds? Is there a new software to help manage your sales and orders? In short, embrace a learning mindset for life of your entire business. A third key to success is using numbers to align activity and decisions with profits. This really starts with understanding what it costs you to grow, harvest, pack, and sell a certain crop. For example, a bunch of carrots. Your costs will vary dramatically if you hand harvest in wet, muddy fields versus loose, drier soils. So the additional winter harvest cost needs to be reflected in the price you get for those carrots. Likewise, it's important to understand what it takes to sell a crop. Direct markets are great for getting top dollar retail prices, and they also require a great deal of additional cost of sales compared to, say, a volume order to a distributor. Again, it's essential to understand your cost to sell into each of these markets to evaluate and optimize your net income. So we aim to be part of an interconnected ecosystem that supports farmers and ranchers. We help farmers to access resources through deep partnerships, um, access capital, access new markets, access land, establish business skills and infrastructure necessary to manage for long-term economic viability. So here's a few of the resources that are available. In terms of capital, um, California FarmLink. Um, Megan said I serve on the board, so I know the organization well. And, and it's a, a sister nonprofit to Kitchen Table Advisors that's a certified community development financial institution providing access to capital through loans. They also put on great workshops, such as one this Thursday in Salinas, aimed at managing business and legal risks. The Farm Credit Network has associations 
that are co-ops of farmers organized across the state and nation. And these are agriculture-focused lenders with programs targeting young, beginning, and small farmers. And then there's the Farm Services Agency, which has great loan programs available. And they can actually be integrated with these other lenders, like Farm Credit and FarmLink, by providing guarantees um, and layering different forms of capital. In terms of accessing markets, um, great resource out there on the UC SEREP website. That's the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. Uh, they have just some fantastic resources available on both direct and intermediated markets and how to access those. You're, you as a farmer are also your best salesperson. Generally, buyers love to talk to farmers, and they want to see you succeed. I'd encourage you to take the time to talk to people such as farmers market managers or values-aligned food hubs or distributors. Even if you're not selling through these channels, they can help you understand the market and the options that are available to you. And then land. Uh, in terms of accessing land, FarmLink also has some great programs there, maintaining an online linking database, as well as a program that is assisting with the transition of businesses run by organic elders to next generation farmers. Regional coordinators uh, in, at FarmLink are also available to help you develop leases and to find land. Land trusts are another great resource. For example, Post on the Central Coast has properties under conservation easement that are available for organic production. There's a number of recent books that are excellent um, that are really focused on farming as a business. And so a few that I think are worth a close, close look are The Farmer's Office by Julia Shanks, uh, Richard Wiswall's The Organic Farmer's Business Handbook, Fearless Farm Finances by Moses in the Midwest. Now each of these books goes much deeper into the topics that I've just barely touched on today. Uh, specific resources will be shared at the end of the webinar, and we'll be following up with a more complete list, including links to websites uh, via email. So thanks again for the opportunity to speak with you. I look forward to hearing from Jim and from Vern and participating in the Q&A. Great. Thank you, Thomas, um, for that overview and mentioning all of those resources that are available out there to um, farmers for land and capital and marketing. Um, and just to let the audience know, we will be sending out a whole list of um, these resources after the webinar, and we'll have some have them listed out and the links up on the PowerPoint presentation when we wrap up. Um, so I wanted to open questions for Thomas. If you have any questions, please send them in. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Kitchen Table Advisors offerings or just general questions, um, feel free to use the questions pane. And I also just wanted to uh, loop back around to the uh, questions we had you write in at the beginning. Um, just to let you all know, we have people here from Chico and Livermore, California. Someone called in from Riley, North Carolina, and also someone from Michigan, and a couple more folks from California. So we got a nice diversity out there. And then people are growing melons, greens, some microgreens, edible flowers, onions, mushrooms, rice, wild rice, and we have a couple of livestock folks on the call. So thanks for writing in. Um, so Thomas, one question that comes up, um, and we've had some people send in, is re in regards to time management. Like, do you have any suggestions for farmers looking to better manage their time? You mentioned there's a lot going on, paperwork, all of this additional stuff that um, how do you advise your clients on time management? Well, yeah, first and foremost, I mean, time is, is the, the single most important asset of the farms that we work with. And so, yeah, knowing how you're spending that time and really focusing the time on the, um, where you're going to add the most value to your business is, is key. So, so 
in really simple terms, um, we just start by tracking it, right? So having logs to be able to track um, and out, you know, understanding where your time is actually going. So, um, you know, you can create it, basically make some buckets where that time goes, uh, you know, and not just for yourself, but also for your crew, um, if you're working with, with employees. Um, so you know how much time, again, going back to the carrot example, how much time is it taking to actually harvest those carrots? Um, and tracking, you know, the hours that it takes to harvest, you know, whatever quantity, so that you can uh, then tr track back to what went into growing and harvesting that carrot to bring it to market. Um, so I think log sheets, which can be simply created in Excel documents, uh, those books that I mentioned um, have templates for, for time tracking logs. So that, that's really the focus that I would take. The, now the trick becomes how do you take that data that you're tracking and how do you make it actionable for decision making? Um, so, so you've got to tie it into some kind of system for taking the data to, to then inform, inform your decisions. Great. Thank you. Um, and that's, yeah, good information to have and good thing to figure out. Um, so we had someone write in wanting to know how do you get into the Kitchen Table Advisors um, program? They um, need some help with marketing. Yeah, so um, I, I, I presume we'll have some contact information for Kitchen Table Advisors in the follow-up email. And uh, I would just encourage interested farmers to, to reach out. Um, you can reach out to me directly. Um, we do uh, reach out to a number of partner organizations all around the Bay Area um, to identify farmers that might be a good fit for Kitchen Table Advisors. And but I would encourage people on this webinar to just reach out to me directly um, so that we can we can get you on the list and, and, and then follow up. Great. Um, and yes, we will send out contact information um, along with the resources when we follow up for the webinar. So if you have want to get into contact with Thomas, that information will be there. Um, we had someone else write in saying that many smaller farms growing sustainably are unable to meet the needed value of their product selling to wholesale markets, but the direct retail market via farmers markets, restaurants, CSAs are already saturated. Do you have any suggestions for overcoming these issues of scale and price points? Well, that's where you get it. Yeah, I mean, that gets into just really nitty gritty, like understanding what market you're growing for, um, what crops you're good at growing. Um, I think if you've, you know, again, I think a lot of farmers have gone towards direct markets in order to, to you know, uh, basically maximize the amount of return they're getting off those crops. Um, but, you know, as, as the listener points out, there's, you know, some of those markets have become saturated. So, so I think then you need to really think about what's that crop mix um, that you are good at growing and what are going to be the best markets. Like what are, what do your customers want and understanding, you know, customers both at a direct level and, you know, but also thinking about customers at, I mean, for example, food hubs have really grown as a result of seeing that there's a need to work with smaller scale farmers to serve kind of, you know, business and institutional accounts. So depending where this person's located, you might want to consider, you know, talking to some of the more values aligned uh, food hubs and distributors, because I, I don't think that f small mark, small farms are necessarily uh, locked out of those markets. So, and that's a, it's a, so that's a big question what, what the, is being asked, but I think it's just, it's all about kind of understanding your customers and what you are passionate about growing and then, and then making you know, then building your business model around that. Great, thank you. And we had another question come in asking um, if you have sample spreadsheets to capture financial data that you could share. Um, you know, so, so I, you know, we do have some basic things we work with. We often work with templates that California FarmLink has, for example, for cash flow projections. Uh, there's in the resource section. There's 
you'll see some links to like farmbiztrainer.com. There's some great kind of simple one-page uh, financial sheets in there. So we often try to work with kind of readily available spreadsheets because none of this is rocket science. And and ultimately, we want to have tools that are accessible to to you know to growers all over. So and then likewise, these books, um, both that organic Richard Wiswell's book and Julia Shank's books, um, they both have uh, access to spreadsheets as well. Okay, great. And what are the titles on those books again? Yeah, so Julia Shank's The Farmer's Office, and then okay. Richard. Richard Wiswell is the Organic Farmer's Business Handbook. OK, great. Um, and again, we'll be sending out those resources um, to the audience. So if you didn't, couldn't scribble it down in time, um, you will get the information. So Thomas, thank you for your presentation. Um, again, we will have questions open for all presenters at the end of the webinar. So if you have any additional questions for Thomas, um, we can send them in and we'll back around at the end of the webinar. So thank you again for your presentation and letting us know about all of the great resources that Kitchen Table Advisors offers farmers. Um, and with that, if we'll move on to our next presenter. Um, Jim Durst. So Jim Durst and Deborah Durst grow and distribute delicious organic produce under the brand names Hungry Hollow and Durst Organic Growers. Durst Organic Growers Inc. strongly believes in farming techniques that build soil fertility while balancing wildlife and insect ecology. They do this by planting cover crops, proper crop rotation, and soil amendments. Their farm practices are based on the maxim, feed the soil, and the soil will feed the plant. They are committed to growing the best tasting and most nutritious produce and promoting a healthier environment for everyone. The Durst's fourth generation farm is in an area of California called Hungry Hollow at the mouth of the Cape Valley in Yolo County. Their unique microclimate and soils allow them to grow delicious tasting asparagus, melons, watermelons, cherry and heirloom tomatoes, peppers, and winter squash. So Jim, thank you very much for being with us today. I know it's spring and you have a lot going on, so thanks for taking the time to share your experience with us. You're welcome, and thank you for allowing me to speak. And I will try to share some of the things I've learned over, I don't know, 30 years now of being an organic producer. And our organic business began in the late 1980s. We're located near the town of Esparto in Yolo County. Our crops include asparagus, tomatoes, watermelons, melons, peas, grain, alfalfa, and winter squash. We've been certified organic for close to 30 years. We began our fresh market operation with a small acreage, five, devoted to tomatoes, melons, and squash, selling into the San Francisco Produce Terminal and two farmer's markets. In the mid-90s, we moved away from the farmer's markets and directed our sales and efforts toward the wholesale and retail markets. As our farm grew, we also had to learn about running a business financing, budgets, accounting, payroll, hiring and firing, farm labor contractors, compliance with laws, taxes. This was an evolving process. We were learning as we went. In the mid-90s, we took classes from the Small Business Resource Center in Sacramento. This was a most helpful resource for us to deal with all the aspects of running a business from writing a mission statement to hiring practices. I would recommend these types of resources to all starting and existing farms. Access to capital was always an issue for us. For the first 10 years, we needed a co-signator and real estate pledge to obtain bank financing. We did not have any extra money since all monies went into growing the business. 
We spent a lot learning. There were not many resources available for developing and fine-tuning organic growing practices. We were learning as we were, we were, I like the metaphor, we were fine-tuning the car as we were going down the track. We were renting all of our farm ground and much of it was less desirable for vegetable production. And we therefore made a concerted effort to rent better ground, offering more money. Sandy looms, and this was a turning point for our business. Better soils can produce the same amount of crop, better crops with less inputs. We valued our customers. And for the first 10 years, we did all our own sales from the farm with seasonal sales personnel. We did crop planning with our customers seeking their input on our cropping plans and varieties and sharing delivery schedules with them. In the mid to late 90s, as it is today, the wholesale marketplaces were constantly changing, both with personnel and with customers. And we eventually hired one of my customers to represent our product in the market, and he became our agent. This was also a good decision for us, and we ended up getting more for our products through him than we, got, than we were able to get for ourselves. This also allowed us to concentrate our energies and efforts on production, doing the farming. In day-to-day -day operations, we've developed a management team system and hired key individuals to help in the field, office, and packing operations. We hold weekly meetings to plan, troubleshoot, and celebrate successes. We develop good accounting practices, job descriptions, procedures, employee manuals, insurance, et cetera, et cetera. There's a number of stuff that has to be done. In 2004, we instituted on our farm a piece rate payroll system. This is based on the idea that you, people would get paid for what they actually produced. And this was probably another really great decision we made. People, went, people who work on our farm went from earning minimum wage or slightly above to making double minimum wage or more. And it didn't actually cost our farm any more because the, the, the level of production doubled and quadrupled. We have been, through the years, we have been through three accountants, and they have helped us with tax preparation and planning. Uh, Megan, I don't know if I have access to my slideshow. Okay. Um, if you want to try clicking on the image of the slide and then okay. moving down again. There we go. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, to try to do, I can't really go in depth too much, but tell a little about some of the things we do. And good farming practices, I feel, are essential to any farm success, if you're growing one crop or if you're growing 30. Each plant adds to your bottom line, and you have to treat it with respect and nourish it with care. We use, or we have been, our, we chose organic practices because we feel that this is in tune with the way nature farms and that we are basically trying to mimic and improve upon what nature does already. Each practice we do on our farm is important. Our motto is ready, aim, aim, fire. So you got to prepare and be ready and a lot of planning. I spend more time probably planning for the next year in the fall and in the winter than I do actually during the year. Good quality work is the essence of good farms. I know we all don't have the option of choosing where we farm, but if you do have that choice, it's really important in my own mind to try to get onto the best soil you possibly can. Floodplains, sandy loams, it costs more, it costs the same amount of more money to grow on poor soils than it does to grow on good soils. And on poor soils, you generally get less production. So my suggestion, and you can build soils up, but you can't change the, the innate nature of soil. 
And we usually, most of us don't have a, a chance to choose a farm location. But if you are just starting out or if you, you know, try to choose a place that's close to your markets, close to labor and close to farm resources as possible. If you have to spend a lot of your time on the highway, that's time you've taken away from your farming operation. And if you choose to sell wholesale, you need to be near improved roads in order to, for trucks to access your farm or for your own trucks to access the markets. Oops. So, you know, good soil plus good farming practices equal good crops. And as we learned in the early 90s, that farming is much more than growing crops. And this is the part I really don't like, that since I'm kind of the owner, CEO, president, I have to have my hand in all this stuff. And a lot of it I've had to learn, and I'm by no means a professional. But these are just some of the things that you need. You need. If you haven't done it, you're going to need to deal with it at some point. Um, if you're working on, like Thomas said earlier, if you're trying to run your business and financing it with a credit card or high interest rates or something, sooner or later that's going to catch up with you. So if you can get on with a funding source, a bank or some type of lending institution um, so that you have access to capital because uh, it's very difficult to, it's, it's easy to start a farm without capital, but it's hard to keep it going without capital and budgeting, creating your own budgets, accounting, cost accounting, profit and loss balance sheet. Payroll is a big deal. Some, you know, we end up, we have quite a few employees, so it's, uh, we're at the point where we actually have uh, in-house HR and we belong to a lot of HR organizations and farming organizations that help us with training. But as you can see, there's workers' comp, safety training, work orders, job descriptions, employee manuals, payroll taxes, benefits, and the list just goes on and on in regards to payroll. Hiring and firing, um, how do you hire the best people? How do you get rid of the ones that are not too good? And there's a, there's a myriad of laws and regulations that kind of create parameters for those two practices. And then you have to be in compliance with federal, state, and local laws. And, uh, you know, now there's groundwater management agencies and, and uh, regulations off the kazoo for agriculture. I think it's off the two for all businesses. So it's, it's something we all have to be aware of. And sometimes you can fly under the radar, but sooner, sooner or later they create better radar. And you have taxes, federal, state, and local. You have landlords. If you're renting land, you have a landlord that you're dealing with. How much do you pay? How do you determine how much to pay? What are the responsibilities of the landlord? What are the responsibilities of the tenant? Things that need to be outlined in some type of uh, uh, leasing agreement. And for us, you know, we're always learning about marketing. You know, there's we're, we're, we deal, we're, our particular farm is mostly in the wholesale retail business, but um, that changes a lot and your customer bases are always changing. So marketing is a big, a big deal for any farming. It's easy to grow. Marketing is where it takes real skill. And then purchasing equipment, tools, land, how do you do all that? The first thing that we found when we went to the Small Business Resource Center in Sacramento, one of the first things they wanted us to do was create a mission statement. And of course, we had never done one, and we kind of knew a little bit what it was. But I would recommend that, you know, what, at whatever level, write down who you are, what you're about, and what you expect to do with your business. And then you need to share that out with other people, you know, your customers, especially your employees. Your employees need to understand what you're about and the people who you sell to. It's helpful that they know who they're dealing with. And then identifying your market. You know, there's lots of different ways to market. And some, you know, I personally, I'd hate to be getting into the wholesale retail market today because there's a lot of competition. There was a lot of competition when we were doing it earlier, 
in the early 80s and in the 80s and 90s, but it was a little less sophisticated. And now it's becoming much more sophisticated. You have bigger farms involved and who have levels of efficiency that it's hard to deal with. So at some point, though, you just got to get a foot in the door. And if you go that route, you, you're going to have to have packaging, packing standards, quality, and you know, delivery or pickup. But the good thing about wholesale retail business in a fresh market business is that you usually pay it in 21 days. So your money, it's not quite as fast as a farmer's market, but the money is there uh, is usually pretty good. And you know, I think in the organic business, there's a lot of integrity with uh, wholesalers, so they do pay. And and you know, uh, debt is not something any of us want to get into, and we don't want to take on bad debt. We don't want we want our customers to pay. And then the other another form is direct to consumer sales. So if you're doing farmers markets or what in or uh, CSAs and that kind of uh, business, then you are dealing more with a cash economy and you get paid right away. And But the market is not maybe not quite as great as you'd like to get or you'd like to grow. And so it's it, in, in farmer's markets, there's a tremendous time commitment in doing farmer's markets. Plus you have the, the factor of transporting uh, to and from the farmer's market and the human energy involved and so there's some good points to all this. It, I think it just depends on what your production levels are and uh, how far. Not everybody can produce pallets of stuff. You may be able to produce, produce boxes, which, and, which allows you to go take advantage of farmer's markets and CSA. And with the CSA, too, it's the same thing. You have advertising, you got a market, you got a package, you got the delivery. I don't do Internet sales, but I know some people do them. And um, it's probably could be a growing business because um, uh, if you have the ability to, to, to set up a website and to produce product and get it shipped there, then that might be an alternative for some folks. But it, what is difficult is to try to do all of it. It's very difficult trying to balance all of these together. This is, uh, I think this is like 7 a.m. on a packing on a day on our farm product coming in, coming out of our packing shed, waiting to go into the cooler to be cooled down. So we have, you know, it, when when you deal with wholesale resale, there's certain packaging requirements. And um, some of them uh, are, are are sophisticated. Some of them are a little more lax. Some, some wholesale retailers allow uh, specialty packs and stuff. Others want you to sell your cantaloupes nine in a box or six in a box or 12 in a box. It's kind of pre-made by marketing orders. And it, the good thing is just seeing your produce, we grow cherry tomatoes, seeing your produce on display at someone's retail operation and, and getting good feedback from, uh, from customers, both the retail customers and also the consumers that end up buying it. And I, I, you know, diversity is a good business model, and it, but it's also expensive. So, you know, I think you know one thing I always struggle with is what crops do you want to grow? What crops can have a synergy that of equipment and of uh, of of the type of um, farming that you do that work well together? And on our farm, we've chosen over time crops that that complement each other in the field, part of our rotation. So we have vegetables, grain, and alfalfa. Vegetables provide the bulk of the in time income. Grain provides uh, a carbon-rich uh, rotation. And alfalfa come, alfalfa is like a cleanup batter in a baseball game because it cleans up most of the weeds that develop through vegetables. So it's a great crop if you have that option, but some, some way to choke out weeds so that when you come back in with vegetables again, you have a, a clean field. You're not dealing with, with weeds. And then you know, veg crops that we've chosen all use similar. We try to once use similar pieces of equipment and for land prep, planting, irrigation, and fertility. And we choose our veg crops also that if they're not coming all up at the same time, nothing's worse to have, nothing's more difficult than to have 25 crops that all need to be harvested at the same time every day. So it's better to choose your crops seasonally as well. And it also helps you to allow make best use of your facilities and your labor. 
spring, summer, and fall. We are not winter farmers. We we set aside our winter time to do planning and rest. Things that we feel are important allow us to go on in the summer. Field crops like grain and hay also provide a rotation. They require less management and labor as, at the same time providing biodiversity and another level of income. On, on our hay and grain, we don't have our own equipment. We harvest it done by custom harvesters. So we don't have to go out and expense it, you know, tie up a tie up a hundred fifty or two hundred thousand dollars on a combine when we only harvested two hundred acres with it every year. It's cheaper just to go hire a custom operator to do that for me. And I can't go back grow good crops. The essence of a good farm is the crops they produce. And they have to be healthy, they gotta taste good. They have to look good if you're in the wholesale retail market. But even at a farmer's market, they have to look good. You can tell the story so long, but if your crop rots before it gets home, there's something wrong. So healthy crops, healthy crops organically are not impossible. They're very, they're very doable. Um, my wife Deborah has uh, neither of us. We we came into farming without having any accounting experience, basically. And um, my Deborah, my wife Deborah has learned through trial and error and a lot of research um, some of the principles of accounting and choosing the right software. There's a lot of software out there. I think you just have to find something that works. There's some of it's specifically directed to agriculture, but there's a lot of it that is just business software that will actually work. And you can actually just use an Excel spreadsheet and, and develop your own up to a certain level. But you must, I think the important thing is to do cost accounting. Know what it costs to produce what you are growing. Like Thomas was saying earlier, Carrots that you grow in the winter and are harvesting in the mud are much more expensive to harvest and clean than ones that you grow in the spring when, or in the you know, in the early summer or fall when when the when the ground is drier and it's easier to harvest. And then establish and follow good accounting practices. Nobody likes to get stung by some type of fraud. So you need to set up your accounting practices to protect your bank accounts and your credit cards and and uh, hire good people. We work with an or you can work with an accountant or bookkeeping service that will do that for you at a very affordable price. It's, it's not a bad idea to hire somebody to help you do, somebody who knows more than you to do what you do. And determine pricing that returns to the grower a return that covers your cost. So you need the cost of production and the cost of overhead and return a profit to you. We, you know, you need to have on your farm, I feel, my feeling is with us, we needed to have at least three or four crops that had a very good profit margin that helped balance out the whole profit margin of the other crops that we grow. Because we need all the crops for rotation, but some of them have to pay the majority of the bills. And we spent a lot of time developing a good relationship with the bank. And I think it's really important, you know, we have, we've been dealing with the same bank for a long time. And the last thing I have on here, you should have a profit margin. Make sure it's a good profit margin. This is a meeting where we have planning going on and we're celebrating something. But you can see the worksheets in the back where everybody participates and everybody's opinion is important and is honored. And that kind of gets to the next point, which is employees. When hiring, select good people. Develop a hiring process that allows you to screen potential employees. Always hire for character first, skill second. You need both. Sometimes you can teach a skill, but you can't teach good character. Employees are our greatest asset, and uh, I've always made it a point to hire people who can do a job better than I can, because they're the ones who are going to take our business to the diff a different level. If you're not a good salesperson, hire a good salesperson. If you're not a good mechanic, hire a good mechanic. If that kind of thing. That's what I look. As a, as an owner, you have to be. You have to be um, a jack of all trades, but generally you're not allowed the luxury of being a master of any of them. And we create job descriptions, pay living wages and benefits. The one thing about going with piece rate and, is that uh, 
employees can come to our farm and make uh, two double what they make at other farms. And but we expect their uh, them to actually perform double too. So we we used to have we harvest cherry tomatoes during the winter summertime, and uh, we have people that work in our that harvesters who would make between anywhere between fifteen and thirty dollars an hour, which is a living wage for an agriculture. Same thing with asparagus, and we've tried to incentivize most of the jobs on our farm because we knew what our costs were, were, so we needed to set the piece rate that it did not exceed our costs that allowed employees to work a little harder and make more money. And then, you know, letting go of employees who did not meet our expectations. And sometimes it's hard to let go of people, but some people hold you back and they're your employees. And then uh, uh, safety is always really important on agriculture, both both being around equipment and things that can injure you, but also just the ergonomic injuries that happen just because we're using our bodies all the time. And they're very expensive and they're very expensive to mitigate. And um, our motto has always been take time to work on your business, not just in your business. So spend the time to create a business model, uh, things like mission statements and job descriptions because they will allow you to hire good people, if you're even if you're just even if you're not hiring, create a mission statement so you know what the heck you're doing, and then you know the last thing is just enjoy what you do because nothing's worse than waking up in the morning and not wanting to go to work, even if you're the employer. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Jim. That was. Very informative. Um, thanks for you know telling us how your business has developed over the years, as well as all of the kind of insights, um, particularly on the employees. That was really interesting, and I think something that um, you don't hear of often. Um, so thank you. Um, so we had a. If you have questions for Jim, please send them in. Um, and again, we'd also love to hear from you, um, kind of, Jim mentioned a little bit about the accounting systems he used, so we'd love to hear kind of what, what you're doing, are you using Excel, um, some other software that works for you. Um, so one of the questions we had come in earlier is, um, what's your advice for contacting wholesale buyers, like how do you get in touch with them or how do you kind of get your foot in the door? You know, when we first started, <clears throat> I actually, and we were dealing at that time mostly with the San Francisco Produce Terminal on Gerald Street. I would, I had maybe one customer down there. I would, I would call and I would, you know, deliver. And while I was down there, I actually did my own deliveries. So, at, while I was down there, I would just walk around and take some of our stuff and just introduce myself to people working on the docks and people who have produce houses there. And that's kind of, I think you have to go out and market your, your farm. And even with, um, even with wholesalers, you have to get their attention. And, uh, you know, it was helpful for me that the thing that opened the most doors for me was to allow somebody else to do my marketing because there are people who are already in that business and they take, granted, they take a percentage of the cost, but in our situation, the, 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 the guy I was working with, I mean, it was worth it a dollar a box or a dollar fifty a box or a percentage. It was worth it to have him actually get on the phone, call my product, get, get paid for it and pay me for it as opposed to me hiring somebody to be a salesperson and go out and try to and do that work. So if you have an option or a way to, I mean, there's, there's lots of produce vendors out there who represent growers and finding out who they are and how, I mean, probably the oldest one out there is veritable vegetable and uh, they, you know, there are, but there's people like that who would actually, if you have a good product, if you have a good line, they would be interested in representing you to the great, to the larger wholesale marketplace. Great, thank you. Um, good, good advice. And um, we had another 
question come in asking, um, how did you develop your piecework pay scale? One thing we always did was we, tr we did cost accounting. So we actually knew from history, we knew what it cost us to, um, to grow and to harvest a crop. So um, I always keep my harvest cost, harvest and packing cost, at, as a as kind of like a. I always keep it at twenty five percent of my retail market. So if I sell a box of tomatoes for a dollar, my harvest and packing cannot exceed twenty five cents a box. And so I've used that as a as kind of a guideline throughout the years and it actually works really well because it it allows you I'll tell you why because then it, say I'm, I'm producing cherry tomatoes and I we were producing cherry tomatoes and it was costing me four dollars and fifty cents or five dollars a box to harvest it and put it the labor portion to harvest it put it in a package or pack it and put it in the package com combined and so I said, well, it's costing me $5 a box. And I have people out here who are harvesting one to two boxes an hour. So, you know, they're, in order for me to keep my costs down within that range, you know, I had to, I, I had to pay a minimum wage in order for the, because they, they were only producing us one to two boxes an hour. So then we came up with a, a program that said, well, we will pay you minimum wage plus uh, an incentive on top of that of $1.50 a box. So it, what the, that, was, that provided the incentive. So we had people who before were only producing one to two dollars a box, uh, one to two boxes per hour, suddenly were, were picking six dollars boxes a dollar, an hour. So they went from making minimum wage, they say it was ten dollars, they went from making minimum wage up to seventeen and eighteen dollars an hour. Well, they were happy because they were making a lot more money. We were happy because it wasn't costing us any more. In fact, it actually brought our harvest costs down. But you have to know going in what your cost per box is that you're aiming for, and then build your piece rate around that so that you don't want to pay more for, for harvest. You just want to get more boxes per hour and reward the employee with more money. So I don't know if that makes sense. Then there's a, the University of California uh, uh, has a lot of information on piece rate and how to set piece rate. And I would suggest if anybody's interested, for one thing, I think it's the only way to go in agriculture. And the other, if you want to stay in business. And if you want to attract labor. Because if you're paying minimum wage, you're no different than every other farm. But if you're paying double or triple minimum wage, you're going to have people lining up at your doorstep wanting to work. And good harvesting people. These are, you can hire lots of bodies, but you want to hire the best harvesters. You want to hire the best irrigators. You want to hire the best packers. And the best ones are always going to look for the best wage. Great. Thank you. Um, that's Great advice and information, and um, we, for the listeners, will look into finding a, a link to the UC. Um, the guy who has done a lot, Megan, the guy who has done a lot of work there is Gregory Billikoff. Okay. He's, I think he's Chilean. If you can find, find he's the he has the most resources, and I learned a lot. I went to a couple of his sessions. Really remarkable guy. He's got it figured out. Great. Thank you. Um, so we're going to take one more question for Jim and then move on to our next speaker. But I also wanted to just uh, a couple comments and feedback came in about the what record keeping systems people use. So some people are using Excel, um, but interested in learning more about QuickBooks and other software. Um, and then we also had um, uh, someone from the audience write in, and just to remind us all that beginning farmers are not always young, that there are also people in their um, 40s and 50s that also start farms. So I thought that was a good thing to remember. Um, 
And Jim, the last question we have for you is, um, what's the name of the accounting software or system that you use? Well, right now we're using Account Edge. Uh huh. And um, it's not specifically designed for agriculture, but we've modified it to do to put in uh, so we can cost account by field, by crop, and uh, it seems to it works well for us. There's some other software out there that. Um, I think Famous has some accounting software for agriculture. Some of it's pretty expensive. So um, I think you just got to, um, we have another one called Mind Your Own, M-Y-O-B, Mind Your Own Business. And then we use that for a lot of years and then we moved to Account Edge because as our, as our farm grew, M-Y-O-B was no longer capable of doing the cost accounting that we really wanted to do. So we went to another, software called Account Edge. Great. Um, so thank you. And um, again, thank you for the presentation and sharing all of your insights. Um, but now I'd like to move on to our final speaker. Um, last but not least, Vernon Peterson. Uh, Vernon, together with his wife, Carol, son, Eric, Daughter Heather and son-in-law Sean form the Peterson family farm. The Petersons have been farming the same land for five generations and are proud to have transitioned their stone fruit operation, chickens, and packing house to organic. Abundant Harvest Organics is the California Farm Share Service offering a weekly organic fruit and vegetable delivery service, as well as prepared food throughout Central and Southern California. The Petersons and Abundant Harvest work with Californian organic family farmers to bring thousands of consumers a weekly delivery of fresh organic fruits and vegetables. So Vern, thank you very much for being here today. Again, um, we know it's busy season, so thanks for taking the time to speak with us and sharing a little bit about your businesses. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, we say if we if you can make it through May, you're going to make it. So this is our busiest uh, this is our busiest month of the year. But uh, I just love this subject. I love helping people get started and helping them get successful. So uh, this is real real valuable uh, important use of time here. After a little practice, um, they asked that I get uh, a little more specific and a little more personal with my uh, presentation here. So I'll do the personal part um, informally here. <clears throat> yeah, we've been farming our family. Uh, Great grandpa came from Sweden in 1893. Uh, <laughs> a good Swedish trait is stubbornness. So. Each generation has to reinvent itself. Um, and in my own case, my dad passed of cancer. Uh, he was 48 years old and I was 21. So there I was with, um, with a farm and really didn't know uh, exactly how to make it go. The hand I was dealt uh, was clean peaches for the cannery, raisins uh, for sun-made uh, wine grapes that uh, we mostly packed and shipped. Uh, to home wine makers, shipping fruit and uh, chickens. And that sounds diverse, but the bottom line is uh, most all of those from at least our farm standpoint were commodities. And that didn't lend itself uh, to profitability when you're small scale. Um, so after 10 years and 14 hour days, I was broke. I had a wife and two kids, one and three, and had a pity party for about a day and a half. And then I went and managed for a very, very large uh, farm nearby for uh, four seasons. That fourth season, um, I put up four power poles and a $50 used tarp, and we started packing fruit for neighbors, um, or, or started packing my own fruit. That winter, three neighbors came, and 
and uh, asked if I'd do their stuff. And now we're about 27 years after that, and we pack fruit for 50 of our neighbors. Uh, we pack uh, also pack pomegranates and citrus. So we keep uh, 100 people working year-round, uh, mostly here in the shed, but about 25 out on the farm year-round bring in additional help. We've, we have a, about a 4,000 member CSA. Biggest uh, success, we have our son, Eric, daughter, Heather, son-in-law, Sean, involved uh, in our business. Some people think, some people say I'm an innovator, but uh, I like to think of myself more as a survivor. Um, and I'd be doing everyone a disservice if I didn't uh, share our relationship with God, both personally and professionally. Our mission statement is we farm, package, and deliver the most delicious, nutritious, organic products in ways that benefit everyone involved and make Jesus smile. So we try to uh, do that, not just in what we do, but how we do it. And uh, we hang that hang that from the, from banners around the packing shed. Okay, now if I push the down arrow, we'll get to the formal part. I think it's just really important for everybody who's going to get started uh, to ask the question, why? 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 Why for you? Why do you want to be a farmer? Why do you want to have an organic business? And do that uh, real honestly. Get some, get some feedback from uh, friends and spouse and, and stuff. What are your strengths? And mainly, what is your unfair advantage? What are you going to bring to this? Uh, what are you going to bring to the equation that uh, that gives you an unfair advantage compared to your competition. And specifically, being small is a very unfair advantage because you can actually cultivate personal relationships. You can meet specific needs, whether it's a, a CSA customer, whether it's a, a restaurant, whether it's a farmer's market customer. Small is a very unfair advantage. Um, and also filling that farm-shaped hole. Uh, I, I say there's a farm-shaped hole in the heart of every urbanite that can only be filled by a relationship with a farmer. And if, when you're small, you can do that in a way that the big guy can't. So let that be a strength. Um, several people make excellent livings from very small operations, so fight that bigger is better lie. It isn't necessarily. I can show you hundreds of very big farmers that wish they were smaller farmers, but the machine owns them. Um, for your customers, um, what's that perceived itch uh, that, that they're not getting scratched? What's that unmet desire? Um, and, and the best way to find that out is to ask them. Get involved, ask them. Um, in, in my case, I write a 500-word newsletter every week. I do a one-minute video from the farm every week uh, just to, to fill that um, farm-shaped hole, you know, for people. And for your employees, um, what's the opportunity? What's the satisfaction? What's the personal growth? Uh, pay, you know, I really liked what Jim said about uh, pay for performance. We do that everywhere, and I'll get into that in a second. But um, the little stuff is the big stuff. You're going to have to pay enough to get the help you need. That goes without saying. But the little stuff, like respect, time off, being able to call everyone's name, know their kid's name and what they're doing. That goes a long, long way. In addition, everyone here uh, and their families has dental and vision. We do a matching 5% 401k. 
Um, and we also hire a, a company called Marketplace Chaplains. So uh, we believe spiritual health is as important as oral health. Um, that costs about nine dollars a head a month. So it's not a very it's not a real expensive thing and has uh, real uh, payback and employee uh, satisfaction with working here. Um, let's see down arrow. Yeah, the thing I tell farmers is sell it first and then grow it. So many farmers go grow something and then try to figure out how to sell it, and that's totally backwards. It doesn't work. It, it, um, there you got a field of cantaloupes, and I could spend all day telling you how I've broken that rule <laughs> and, and show you the knots on my head from doing it. Uh, over the last 40 some years, but always sell it first, then grow it. Find out what people want to buy and what they're willing to pay for it. You have to stay out in blue water. If you get in red water, it is no fun. It's red because it's bloody. So stay in front of what people want, where they want it. Uh, and, and here's some reality. Uh, what are your costs? You got to know your costs. Uh, Jim spoke of software. We use one called BizBooks. So um, located in O'Neill's here, but it's really strong on uh, cost accounting. So we know what each field is doing, each project is doing. But we use a lot of Excel as well, so that we know what our costs are. Um, literally per day in lots of cases, per lot. Um, so uh, you got to know your costs. Uh, what specific in infrastructure you're going to need to grow those crops uh, that you've already sold. <laughs> Get a drink here. And then capital, big deal. Got to have a relationship with the bank, um, but human capital is even more important. So relationships with people, um, monetary. So capital, human capital, monetary capital, technological capital, um, being on the leading edge of uh, with with everything you do is super important. And then your, the reality of your personal time commitment to this. If you're, I think if you're going to run any kind of a business, but I would think especially an ag business, it is going to consume a lot of your time if you're going to be successful at it. Um, is that the way you're made up? You know, Some of us are just wired to be entrepreneurs and to be self-employed and chafe under um, being an employee. Uh, other people, uh, <laughs> when I was drawing a paycheck, my wife was the happiest. But anyway, uh, we're all wired different. Um, and then specifics. I want to I want to spend a good amount of time here getting to specific. We are very big on measuring published. And anybody here can give you this quote. Anything that's measured and published improves automatically. And if I was Mr. Rogers, I'd say it again, and then I'd have you say it. But again, anything that's measured and published improves automatically. Uh, it's not an easy thing to figure out what's important to your company. Um, but as the leader of it, as the manager of it, uh, that's what you have to do. Once you figured that out, it's still not easy to figure out how to measure it. Um, but if you can figure out what's important, how to measure it, and then how to publish it. If, if I know that Betty is doing a better job than Jane, but I don't publish that, I know it, but it doesn't improve the situation. If George's crew 
is doing an excellent job quality-wise of harvesting. And Bill's crew is doing a lousy job, but I don't publish that. It doesn't improve the situation. But if every load of fruit that comes in gets measured and at the end of and weighed, <laughs> and at the end of the day we put out a mass uh, email text to everybody, every farmer, every foreman, every labor contractor involved in today's harvest. They all get a mass communication that says how many pounds they picked, what were the defects. Um, first thing you do is you go see how you did, then you go see how everybody else did, and then you'll have a pretty good idea what the conversation is going to be um, out in the field tomorrow morning. <clears throat> so once you've once you have uh, mastered that um, measure publish, then you can go to pay for performance that Jim was talking about. About to some not everything we do can be uh, done piecework or I call pay for performance, but about two thirds of it is it's done by the tree, by the pound or by the box. Um, we're also, marketing-wise, very focused on a balanced program. So from our shed, you've got peaches, plums, apricots, nectarines, white, yellow, <laughs> black, and red every week, no dogs. And we always try to have something that's superior, some variety that buyers really want. They don't all have to be that, but you have to have something that's just kick butt. Um, if you have that and everything else is fine, it literally raises the value of everything by a couple bucks. Um, or, uh, or flip that around, if you only have one thing, even if it's good, um, just from a practical standpoint, that buyer has to um, that buyer, whether it's Whole Foods and Walmart or it's um, you're delivering to restaurants, um, your own costs of distribution increase if you've only got one thing. If you have a balanced program, everything, everything works. To accomplish that uh, in such uh, capital, so by capital I mean land and time, it takes four plus years from the time we plant an orchard until we harvest it. So we have a, um, a capital intensive industry. So we've formed an alliance with lots of small organic growers. We all function as one. We decide when somebody wants to replant, you plant a variety that, that uh, fits a hole that we have um, if you want to be part of the group. Um, specifics for our CSA, we're very transparent with our farmers about volume, quality, and pay. So we have a quarterly breakfast uh, with our main producers. Um, they decide amongst themselves um, who's going to grow what in the upcoming season. Um, price is based on a good FOB, less packaging sales, cold storage. Uh, this net back to the farm is uh, paid on delivery. So uh, the only thing we don't nail down in advance is the exact volume, but we have a pretty good guess. So farmer leaves with a check on delivery before he's even paid uh, his help, her help, um, whichever. Uh, we have a host in each of the, I don't know, 120 or 30 communities. They get 6% uh, of growth. Uh, their responsibilities include securing and operating the delivery site, marketing, and first customer relations. Uh, hi, Mary. I see you have a large box, dozen eggs, um, that kind of stuff. Customer service, all dissatisfactions are fixed on the next delivery. 
If that isn't good enough, we'll refund your money. All correspondence is answered within one business day. We answer our phone, um, and we've added uh, kitchen to our service. Uh, so prepared meals as well as meal kits. Or, but I won't say we have that all figured out. That's just something we're trying to figure out, trying to stay in blue water, you know. Um, and I'm being very transparent here. Um, let's see, do, 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 do. we'll skip that because I already said it. In the packing house, measure and publish is ubiquitous uh, from incoming through finished. <clears throat> I already spoke about this first bullet point. Um, but to back up what Jim said, our average harvester last year made $19.73 an hour. And that included some hourly where they got $11. So um, pay for performance uh, is a big deal. Um, we also, it's important for the farmers. We tell every farmer how many pounds were lost to each defect from each lot. When we changed it from a percentage to pounds, you know, Charlie, you lost uh, 719 pounds to worms from that lot. Um, then Charlie can make an a intelligent business decision about the value of keeping those worms out, as an example. Um, or you picked a green or, or whatever. <clears throat> we show every packer the quality of her work and how that compares to everyone else. Uh, that's posted uh, right next to the time clock, so best packer, worst packer. Um, and again, anything that's measured and published improves automatically. Um, and finally, no money, no mission. There is a, There are a lot of things you want to do. Uh, good things for your community, good things for your employees, um, and good things for your own family and your own business. And if we don't make money, we can't do any of those things. So um, that's what I got. Great. Thank you very much. Um, that was a... Uh a nice uh, overview of your operation, and um, the, I like the, the questions, the why, giving us a little bit to think about about what, we're, what you're doing on your farm and what your mission is. That was very, very helpful. Um, and again, kind of, but you, both you and Jim have um, really emphasized the importance of you know, good accounting practices and taking care of your employees. It sounds like that's kind of at the heart of what you're doing. Um, so yeah, thank you again for your presentation. And um, as I mentioned before, we know you got a lot going on. Um, in addition to running two businesses, Vern also serves on the board of directors here at CCUS. So he's got um, fingers in many pies. And we thank you for taking the time to share your expertise today. So if you have questions for Vernon, please send them over. Um, and again, we'd love to hear a little bit about your operation, how many staff members you have on your farm. Um, you know, we have, we have 100 uh, people year-round. I think I said that. We have, uh, you know, uh, seven key players, uh, they, and they spend one day a month uh, working on our business off-site. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's organized to where it works if I'm not here. Um, some say it works better if I'm not here. <laughs> but magically, things go a little better if I'm around once in a while. That's great. Um, so, we had a, a question come in that was um, wondering, sort of wanted to know a little more about how you got into the vegetable delivery service. Um, yeah. And your um, operation. 
Sure. Our industry, stone fruit, went through a two-thirds washout between 98 and 2000. I'm, I'm sorry, 2010. Between 98 and 2010, that 12-year period, two-thirds of our farmers, packers, brokers, marketers, cold storages uh, went away. Um, so, you know, uh, about three years, three, four years into that, um, we decided, you know, looks like we're going to die. Uh, but let's die running and not uh, whining. So we flipped everything which to organic uh, in 2002, I believe. Um, and it wasn't easy. It's farming organic for three years while getting paid conventional. But um, somehow we made it through that, that Swedish stubbornness. Um, but when we got out the other end, uh, it wasn't any more, we found it wasn't a whole lot more delightful selling to some of the large organic retailers than it was selling to the large uh, conventional retailers. Um, again, the foundation of what we're doing is uh, packed stone fruit going out to retailers all over North America. So we decided to uh, to do the sim while simultaneously people loved what we had. So <laughs> we were being disrespected by the buyers while being loved by the consumers. So that's uh, that was the motivation. It wasn't uh, anything altruistic. It was just trying to figure out how to keep our head above water. Thank you. That's, that's interesting to hear. And um, yeah, the kind of going with the marketplace and um, as you mentioned before, um, letting your unfair advantage sign shine. So um, thank you. Um, and we're going to open it up to all the speakers now. So if you have any other questions for Thomas or Jim, feel free to send them in. We are getting close to the time where we're going to need to wrap up. So again, we apologize if we can't get to your specific question, but please do send them in. Um, so there was someone that was wondering if um, either Jim or Vernon, you have used conservation easement on your property. For Vernon, no. Okay. Yeah, I, I have not either. OK, great. Thanks. Um, and then we had another question come in that um, is asking that how does abundant harvest ensure um, personalities, management styles, backgrounds, philosophies, um, et cetera, are cooperative rather than clashing, um, especially or um, particularly since it's uh, you're a fast-growing business? So that's a question for Vernon. Um, yes, that's a question for Vernon. Okay. Um, my uncle pulled me aside. Uh, for instance, we pack a million boxes all year. He does a million and a half in May. So that gives you an uh, um, example of size and scale. But he, he, some cousins and I were talking about doing a joint venture on a produce marketing thing and he pulled me in his aside and he said nephew nothing works because everybody loves each other it's okay if they do but somebody somewhere the buck has to stop that's all he said <laughs> and I've never forgotten that uh, so you know somebody um, somebody needs to be where the buck stops. And in, in, in our case, that's me. Um, how you would do it uh, in a different setting, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I do know, though, that we also work with family. Um, wife's involved, son, daughter, son-in-law. And everybody's got to give quite a bit. So it's really similar to a marriage. 
um, and the leader needs to put everyone else's needs ahead of his own. So I think if the leader does that, while mindful that uh, if it if folks aren't getting along, it's his responsibility to fix it. Um, so I don't have a simple equation, but that's what I can say to that. Okay, great. Thank you. So I think we are reached the end of our webinar today. I wanted to thank all the speakers again um, for taking their time to be with us and share all of their experience um, and resources that are out there. I think, again, that kind of what you all covered today is that, you know, good accounting, knowing what's going in and out and how much, you know, keeping track of all your money as well as taking good care of your employees are two key concepts for running a good agriculture business. Um, and also that there's a lot of resources out there. There's the universities um, and a lot of things online that you can uh, used to help build your business. And so as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to quickly just touch upon some of the resources that Thomas mentioned during his presentation. Um, as for land, there's farm link and local land trusts. Um, business planning, there's the one page plans from farm business trainer. Um, and then capital, there's also Farm Link, Farm Credit, and Farm Surges, Farm Services Agency. Markets, the University of California, as well as Family Farmed, have um, some great resources for selling to wholesale and direct marketing. And for organic, um, if you're looking for resources for organic record keeping, kind of outside of the general accounting the National Center for Appropriate Technology, NCAT, has a really good organic farming resource page which has example templates. And CCOF also has a whole record keeping section specifically for organic record keeping. And I also wanted to um, give a heads up about a couple workshops, um, intramural incentives that are coming up in the fall by our partner organization, Farmers Guild. They will be held in various spots around California. So if you're in California, it would be worth to check them out. They're two days long. And the ones that they ran earlier this year included lease clinics, bookkeeping, marketing. So it'll go into a lot more depth about a lot of the topics that we covered today. And um, CCUF also has some upcoming events. Uh, in June, we will be having a webinar for organic processors and handlers on streamlining organic paperwork. Um, so again, that's for processors and handlers. But if you're a grower that does some of that stuff, you might find the webinar um, interesting. We're also putting together our education calendar for the fall. And we do do go on a tour of the San Francisco Wholesale Produce Market almost every year. So that's something to keep in mind for the future. And we, CCOS is one of many certifiers. Um, we encourage you to do your homework and find the certifier that's right for you. There's about 50 in the US. And the U, um, USDA Agricultural Marketing Service website has a great place you can go to check out all of the other certifiers out there. If you're interested in um, organic certification with CCOF, contact Jane Wade. She is a, um, our new applicant li liaison and can answer all of your questions. She's a really great resource, so we encourage you to follow up with her. So thank you again for being here today, and thank you to our speakers for taking the time to be here. And also, I wanted to give a final thank you to our sponsor, Valent USA LLC. So we hope you found the presentation informative. Um, please fill out your evaluation form. It'll pop up once you close out of GoToWebinar. And again, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to follow up and um, let us know. We will be sending out a recording of the webinar, a copy of the PowerPoint slides, and a whole list of resources once we get the webinar up on 
our website, which will be a day or two. But thank you again, and have a great afternoon.